Hi, welcome to the Quipster Film Review Podcast. I'm Vince Leo. I am the film critic for the website Quipster.net. Thanks for joining me today. I hope that you enjoy the review that you're about to hear. If you do, I do encourage you to click the subscribe button and you continue to get all of my reviews downloaded into your podcast player throughout the year. Also, if you don't mind reading, you can also check out over 3,800 of my written reviews at my website, quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. So it's been a few days since I've done a review, so I'm kind of itching to get back into it. Unfortunately, since it's the week after Captain America Civil War... Very few films want to come out against that. So we have kind of a dead period here. We do have one film that is out in major release. It's called Money Monster, and it stars George Clooney and Julia Roberts. It's a dramatic thriller. It's rated R because of language throughout, some sexuality and brief violence. The runtime is an hour and 38 minutes. In addition to Clooney and Roberts, it also features a sizable role for Jack O'Connell, Katrina Balfe, and supporting roles for Dominic West, Giancarlo Esposito, and Christopher Denham. The director is Jodie Foster, and the screenplay is by Jamie Linden, Alan DeFiori, and Jim Koof. In Money Monster, George Clooney stars as Lee Gates. He's a flashy Jim Cramer-ish cable television network host of a financial advice program called Money Monster, He's happy to dole out stock advice in his snarky, cocky manner, and he draws more out of entertainment and spectacle than in how what he says might affect those on the other side should any of his so-called rock-solid tips prove wrong. Someone that Lee has affected in a negative way through his advice finally forces him to learn firsthand just what impact that he's making for the people who lose money based on his advice when a distraught young man named Kyle Budwell, played by Jack O'Connell, storms onto the set during the live feed of the show. Kyle forces Lee at gunpoint to put on a vest full of explosives. He wants some answers, as well as some contrition on his part, after losing his life savings on supposedly surefire advice from Lee in putting one's money on a company called Ibis Clear Capital. This is a company that Lee persistently extolled the virtues of and which ended up suffering a major setback to the tune of $800 million in losses practically overnight. Ibis claimed that this was a software glitch due to its complicated corporate algorithm that was responsible for things going haywire. And now, because he's at gunpoint with the vest of explosives stuck on him, Lee's going to have to put his life on the line to get Kyle those answers that he's seeking from the show's slated guest, the CEO of Ibis, Walt Camby, who is played in the film by Dominic West. He's kind of a no-show. Nobody knows exactly where he is. So they need somebody who is going to be on board to explain how this unlikely event could occur that would cost investors like Kyle, among many others, to potentially lose their livelihoods on what is touted to be a freak error. Julia Roberts also stars in the film. She plays Money Monster producer Patty Fenn. Patty is set to leave to greener pastures to work for another network across the street. She's the voice in Lee's earpiece who keeps trying to tell him to stay on point. And in this case, she ends up being the one who's trying to keep him alive. She feeds him advice on what to do or to say to his violent, unexpected guest, knowing that Lee tends to ramble on and probably say the wrong thing, whatever pops in his mind. And she ends up making the decision to keep directing the show, coercing her host to do his job and get Kyle the answers that he's after by actually asking for the first time those tough questions to Ibis Chief Communications Officer Diane Lester, played by Katrina Balf, in lieu of actually getting to the absent Canby for information. Those questions make Diane Lester, who was hired to just deliver PR talking points and also on the side to entertain Camby, she takes a more aggressive stance with trying to find those answers and she ends up digging for some real info that now she's curious about herself from her boss, Camby. Money Monsters directed by Jodie Foster and... Jodie Foster should get some credit here for trying to tackle on some pretty weighty and timely themes on greed, corruption, the responsibility of the media, 
But unfortunately, these aspects, though they are worthy of making a film around, continuously get buried underneath implausible plot turns and some not too exciting thriller elements within the course of the movie. Certainly the right messages are there. The complicit nature of corporate-owned media and putting big business and money above the concerns of everyday people. There's the current state of the news industry to put entertainment above information. And there's also how little investigative work actually gets done by reporters who literally here in this film have to have a gun pointed to their head before they'll actually ask tough and relevant questions to those who are obviously lying to the public that they're supposed to be keeping informed above all else. This could also be seen as a cynical look at the apathy of the American public so accustomed to bombast and spectacle to drive ratings, even on news programs, that even the possibility of a live execution on television becomes an entertaining media circus in and of itself. Now, instead of that potent and insightful film that would be suggested by the topic, we get one that would rather coyly play with its food instead of hungrily devour it. Comic relief moments land mostly with a thud, such things involving Gates making one of his crew test a newfangled erection cream just before the show. It ends up working all too well as a cream goes, but it's something we're supposed to find amusing when he actually puts it into play when so one of the film's obviously contrived attempts at humor that falls flat. The tone of the film is erratic, to say the least. It's too glossy to delve into the reality of the issues underneath the surface. And like the Money Monster TV show, it's too concerned with entertainment entertaining its viewing public to really try to get to some honest answers about Wall Street, about the media, and about the current state of indifference by the underserved populace whose would-be concerns have been consistently disregarded by both the media and Wall Street. And one of the larger issues of the film's inability to connect comes from characters that we either don't come to care about or that we immediately despise. Even a likable and charismatic actor like George Clooney, he struggles to make Lee Gates remotely relatable enough to root for. He finally shows some humanity under the TV-friendly smarm and charm, but he's still a showman. He's not a newsman. And he literally performs song and dance for the public, and he probably has never had to ask a tough question in his life while on the air. To think that he's returning to journalistic chops to do so, even when forced at gunpoint, seems pretty incredulous given his character. Meanwhile, Julia Roberts, she's adequate in a role that really doesn't require a big-name star of her caliber. Jodie Foster requested that Julia Roberts' role get beefed up beyond the level of importance to the story because of her casting. It initially was going to be mostly just a two-man film, but Foster ended up bringing stronger roles to the female cast members, both Julia Roberts and Katrina Balfe. Even though Patty, Julia Roberts' character, is concerned for the safety of her crew, first and foremost, the fact that she tries to make so-called great TV out of this fiasco not only makes what happens seem incredibly far-fetched, but it also deflates our ability to relate to her position as something that would resemble anything that a real human being might do in her situation. Plus, other than the fact that she's about to leave the show and has felt generally underappreciated by Lee Gates for her efforts, there's really nothing of her character of significance, so it really doesn't merit this much screen time for her, even though Foster had ordered Julia Roberts' role to be retooled to bring her more to the forefront. And then there's the most emphatic issue of a lack of sympathy for the man who lost his livelihood playing the stock market on Gates' advice, Kyle Budwell. Jack O'Connell plays Budwell. He's fine in the role, albeit with an iffy Queens, New York accent. But his character in this movie feels too idealized. It's too utilitarian to the film's plot whenever it needs to be called upon. And we never really truly buy him as the so-called voice of the people. The film seems to think that we should be rooting for Kyle as that crusader of conscience who finally does what the American public hasn't actually done, which is to hold someone responsible for their actions on Wall Street, as well as their bedfellows in the media. But the way that the film plays out here, he still comes off like an ignorant crackpot above all else. Without our concern for his life, or even the life of Lee Gates... 
There's really little tension in the so-called riveting thriller sequences, and that leaves us and the audience only rooted in seeing where things might ultimately go in this quest for an answer from Walt Camby on exactly where things went haywire for his company. Jodie Foster, as a director, she labors mightily to make this film as important as she seems to be striving to make it. She tries in vain to hold the film together despite some forced situations heavily contrived in the screenplay that's credited to Jamie Linden, who also wrote We Are Marshall and Dear John. He retooled the screenplay by Jim Koof, who was a screenwriter credited for such films. They're not really great films, but I guess they were somewhat popular, Rush Hour and National Treasure. He also wrote that really terrible film with Jimmy Fallon and Queen Latifah called Taxi. In more recent years, Jim Koof created the television show Grimm, and he wrote a screenplay along with one of Grimm's writers, Alan DeFiori. If the film is meant to be a satire, it doesn't really congeal as such. It's caught somewhere between being maybe one third of it being a silly workplace comedy and the other two thirds of it being this dark thriller. These are aspects that are often at odds with each other during whole scenes. I guess you would say two great tastes that don't really taste great together. The plot points are ridiculous in this film. For instance, the NYPD, rather than talk directly to Kyle and try to talk him out of this situation, they seem to prefer just taking up arms and killing him. And they also hatch this scheme where they want to shoot Lee in a spot that would defuse the explosive vest without actually killing him. It's a very risky proposition, especially considering they haven't explored all options of peace beforehand. So really, is this a great plan or what? Now, this brings about another issue with the film, which is that of focus. Because these efforts to show the police struggling with what to do about the situation are unnecessary. They're largely unenlightening to the point of the film. So I do feel that they'd be better relegated to the proverbial cutting room floor. And the same could be said about frequent breaks from the main action to spotlight other characters around the world who get involved in the situation in a very tertiary manner and don't really merit any screen time. Uh, For instance, we get a peek into the life of a Korean computer programmer who designed the maligned algorithm. He's in this film for a few minutes, but not really in any way that really brings anything other than distraction. We also go to Iceland to deal with a couple of hackers who end up prying into seemingly every video camera system on Earth for some improbably speedy and very accurate face-matching searches. You know, this film is supposed to be set in real time, so about 90 minutes of time, I guess. But the way that this plays out could never have been done in this kind of time. We also get callback scenes to this South African rebel named Mambo. He's leading a strike against a platinum mine. Obviously, it's going to end up tying into the main plot, and once it does, it just it's as ludicrous as the rest of it. And then there are frequent cutaways to how other news organizations and industry pundits are covering the events that are happening to Lee Gates, seemingly just as mindless and as snarky as the rest. They don't seem to be incredibly concerned, and the American public shown as barely interested in the value of human life, such that they'd rather create memes out of situations that wind up with people dead or nearly dead, it makes you even root against us, or so-called us, as American people, undeserving of being rescued from corporate swindlers for deliberate obliviousness to current events and callous disregard of each other as a caring community. We are the worst of it, and all in all, we seem pretty happy to be reckless idiots the way that this film shows the American public. So really, it begs the question, why shouldn't corporations prey upon fools and our soon-to-be-parted money? And the worst aspect of the plot comes from the amateur sleuthing that's done on the part of Diane Lester in trying to figure out whether the sudden tanking of the company's stock price was indeed just a glitch, or maybe it's an act of malice or something else entirely that is being covered up by her boss. The egregiously contrived hows and whys of Lester's actions might have you rolling your eyes right out of your head as it plays out. 
Money Monster is just too tonally erratic. It's too fantastical to buy as something resembling our own known reality. And that makes the film a missed opportunity to make a potent topical issues film that rips the mask off of the facade of infotainment on television. And how these kinds of news programs that seek to entertain more than inform continue to cover the stock market as some sort of big money game, as some sort of gambling operation than a real business, despite potentially having dire consequences to the lives of millions of people on the line with each progressive gamble by any of these corporations or investors. While it is commendable in a film to see news people return to trying to become the conduit for the concerns of the public instead of just being spokespeople for these corporations that they're supposed to be covering, one would gather by the end of this misfire of a film that very little actual light has been shed on the topic that will change the industry. As such, the film threatens but can't deliver on the ultimatums of putting the ills of the current corporate structure of television news under scrutiny, and for that, Money Monster becomes like its supposed working-class anti-hero at the heart of this movie, willing to take up arms to hold the industry hostage, but unsure of what or how to do things once they actually take control of the cameras. Two stars goes to Money Monster, a real misfire. It's too bad. I like Clooney. I like Roberts. I like Foster. I think she has a lot of ideas. And yet this film is just so full of nonsense. I can't accept it as part of reality. For this film to work, it has to be rooted. It has to feel real. It has to be revelatory of something that we can identify with in reality. And like Money Monster, it tries to entertain more than inform. And unfortunately, it becomes a victim of its own themes. So Money Monster, a real misfire. And I'm only going to give it two stars, which means I found it lacking something vital that would keep it to being to being even worthwhile for those people who are fans of Roberts and Clooney. Definitely not their best work. Sorry, I couldn't be more positive, but I do thank you for listening. I hope that you enjoyed the review. And if you do and you happen to have the ability to leave a review wherever you happen to download this podcast, I do encourage you to do that because word of mouth is the best way that you can show your support for the show and to get the listenership up so that I can continue to deliver all of these reviews all throughout the course of the year and hopefully many years to come. Until next time, thanks for listening. I hope that you enjoy your time anytime you get to the movies. And if you've seen Money Monster and you have a differing opinion or even want to agree with me, you can find all of my contact information at my website, quipster.net. That's Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net.